we had in our midst a new member sitting crumpled looking like a curious ball, old and wrinkled. Her long black hair with the faintest glimmer of silvery gray hung in two plaits down to her waist. She sat still as a bowing statue. The stillness and the surrender of the American Indian of Guyana in reflective pose. Her small eyes winked and blinked a little. It was an emotionless face. The stiff brooding materiality and expression of youth had vanished. And now in old age, there remained no sign of former feeling. There was almost an air of crumpled pointlessness in her expression. The air of wisdom that a millennium was past. A long, timeless journey was finished without appearing to have begun, and no show of malice, enmity, and overt desire to overcome oppression and evil mattered any longer. She belonged to a race that neither forgave nor forgot. The Arawak woman pointed, and vigilance, straining his mind from the volcanic precipice where he clung, looked and saw the blue ring of Pentecostal fire in God's eye as it wheeled around him above the dreaming memory and prison of life until it melted where neither wound nor witch stood. Don, of course, had previously despised the Amerindian woman. Yet, ironically, it is she who leads the crew to their epiphany. Harris uses Amerindian characters in this way elsewhere in his fiction, highlighting the meeting of cultures, the tendency we have to discount the other person's perspective, and the importance of resisting that tendency so that we can come to a mutuality of understanding and respectful recognition. In Chumachimari, for instance, the meeting of cultures occurs when the surveyor on a team speaks with an Amerindian crew member about the river they are working on in connection with a hydroelectric power project. For the Western trained surveyor, the river is about quantifiable volume and rate of flow about tides and currents. For the Amerindian, the river is alive with the spirits of the ancestors, a sacred space, an unknowable entity, a place where the gods live. It is to these cultural clashing points, these meeting points, that Harris directs us, insisting that if we go deeply enough, the seemingly mutually exclusive perspectives are not so very different after all. Ironically, it seems to the Amerindian that the theodolite the surveyor relies on is like the eye of a god. In Sleepers of Roraima too, Harris takes up myths and legends of the indigenous peoples of the region and uses them to develop his discussion of the effect on our psyche of our history of colonization. He goes further, showing that in order to break out of the damaging patterns of the past, there needs to be an imaginative reconstruction of our narrative. Drawing on myths and legends, cave paintings and petroglyphs for his inspiration, Harris reinvents an Amerindian past that is other than Columbus's narrative regarding cannibals. In Harris's hands, stories of the eating of human flesh may well have been a joke a trick played on the conquistadors, who, we are reminded, were very good Catholics who regularly partook of the flesh and blood of their respective God. By this slate of hand, 
the vast gulf between Christian and cannibal is removed and the word communion is suddenly invested with new significance. The horrific accusation and stigma of cannibalism becomes a metaphor for cross-cultural influences, suggesting that they have a life-giving sacredness. Are we really huntsmen of bone? Eurocon asked, looking down at his uncle and through the sky as he sailed in space. For it was as if the blue trunk of the ocean stood there, whittled down to a cross, coral and bone, octopus in whose blood ran tin, sponge in whose crevices ran gold. We became huntsmen of bone when we ate our first Spanish sailor, his uncle replied to the intricate sticks of the sky. For that reason, we are sometimes called cannibals. He looked sardonic, his left eyebrow cocked in quizzical fashion, pointing still to the kite, paper of heaven nailed to wood. Cannibals, said the boy startled. I don't see why anyone should call us that. For that reason, we are sometimes called cannibals, the man repeated, pursuing his own thread of thought backwards into time. We ate a Spanish sailor. How can you say such a thing, Eurocon cried, descending from kite to earth in a flash and stopping dead, riveted now to the ancient trunk of man, the lines and brow, the anchor of subsistence. His uncle nodded to a silent tune and reaching up into the nest, drew forth a thin bone or flute. He passed it over his lips without making a sound, polished it between the palms of his hand, and after this palaver with the dead, gave it to Eurocon, who blew, in his turn, a sad yet vibrating melody of space. All at once, he could hear and feel running through his hands the giant tremor of that bird, the ladder of the pilot, as it flew soundlessly through the sky, chained to the earth. He could also hear an unwritten symphony, the dark roots in the past of that tree, a strange huddle of ancestral faces attuned to quivering wings, which they plucked with their fingers like teeth. And then, silently, as if for the first bitter time, tasted the fear of the strings, ascent and descent, transubstantiation of species, half tender, half cruel, like a feast. Do you mean, said Eurocon, as the first wave of magical numbers struck him, that it was a game to make them think they had been eaten? He stopped, aware of a walking plight in the valley of sleep, the plight of feeling akin to non-feeling, flesh akin to spirit. In a manner of speaking, yes, said his uncle approvingly, make them think they had been eaten. Make them into a song of spirit, a morsel in our mouths, nothing more. The morsel of the flute, that was all. He waved his hand nonchalantly. Eurocon nearly spat the flute from his mouth. <laughs>